أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مد حقه القاعلون ولا يحصي نعماءه العادون ولا يؤدي حقه المجتحدون الذي لا يدركه بعد الحمم ولا يناله غوص الفطن ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا والشفيع ذنوبنا سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين صاحب العصر والزمان خليفة الرحمن ما ملنس والجان ولعن الله وعداهم جمعين إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أفرأيت من اتخذ إلهه حواء وضله الله على علم وختم على سمعه وقلبه وجعل بصر غشاوة فمن, يح فمن يحده من دون الله أفلا تذكرون صدق الله العلي العظيم First of all, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the continued tawfiq to gather like this, to remember Imam Hussein, to have that tawfiq to be that manifestation of the dua of the Holy Prophet when he told his daughter there will be a nation that will gather year in and year out to grieve for your son Hussein. I ask Allah to accept your grief inshallah and your gum from the first of Muharram up until now. On a personal note, it is an honor for me to be here in Houston for the first time, as Reza had mentioned. Uh, we've been trying for several years to get me here, and alhamdulillah, I am uh, honored to be here amongst all of you, the Mu'mineen. I read a sign at the airport that, that said that Houston melts hearts. <laughs> Apparently, it melts everything else as well in this city. It's a hot city, mashallah, yes. Uh, and. Uh, I don't know if I can bring the cold from Toronto, but inshallah we'll do our best. Thirdly, I've asked this alim to my left to kindly leave the majlis very respectfully. Sheikh Azim Khoja is a dear friend of ours and uh, he's kind enough to be here. He said, I wanted to listen to you, Agha, and benefit from you. Khair, once he hears the first one, he himself won't come back tomorrow anyway, so it's okay. For his tawfiq, his family, please one loud salawat ala Muhammad ala Muhammad, please. As mentioned, you are stuck with me for five nights. From tomorrow, you have a choice. From tonight, you're mine, inshallah. And a topic, of course, has been chosen. And we will expand that topic across five nights. And the topic is the captivity of religion. <clears throat> Deen asir And we'll explain what that means in a moment. And this comes really from two different sources. This istalah, this terminology is not mine, of course. When we look at the letter of Maliki Ashtar and Najib Balagha, letter number 53, when Imam Ali alayhi salatu was salam, Allahumma salam, is of course training Malik on how to lead a nation, and it is of course a comprehensive letter that many of you know about. There's a line in there that's very interesting. Of course, the whole letter is profound. This line, however, we have to ponder a little bit more on it. He says, فَإِنَّ هَذَا الدِّينَ قَدْ كَانَ أَسِيدًا That surely, Malik, know that this deen, هَذَا الدِّينَ And I have to explain what هَذَا الدِّينَ means. Why the need to say this deen? That itself, I have to dissect these words for all of you tonight. For myself, really. This was a deen قَدْ كَانَ أَسِيدًا That was a captive in prison. With who? With what? Fi'aydil Ashrar. At the hands of those who are known as Ashrar. 
at the hands of those who do sharr, evil individuals who are the manifestations of injustice. These were people that Imam Ali says the deen was in their hands and they didn't do anything with it. In the process, they imprisoned religion. They made religion weak. They placed this prison in ideological jail. For two reasons, he says. One is that they acted on their khaishat, their desires, and they chased the dunya. Now you take these words by Amin al and come to the verse that I had the tawfiq to recite in the khutbah from Surah al Jafia, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now says, have you seen those individuals who do what? Ilahahu hawa. They take their lowly desires to be their ilah, to be their God, to be the one that they worship, to be the one that they answer to. And because of it, it's very interesting. He says that Allah now has misguided them, not because they're jahil, not because they don't know anybody, ala ilmin, based on their knowledge, now they're misguided. Ajib. You would think that an alim, let's say, a person who has some knowledge, is a person who's with knowledge, with guidance. But Allah says, these are not people who don't know any better, people who are illiterate, people who live, let's say, for example, in some unknown jungle, no, no access to any sort of knowledge. No, these are people who are very much knowledgeable. In fact, maybe they know four-syllable words, and maybe they have all sorts of letters after their name. And based on that very ilm, Allah says, I have made them guided off the path. I pulled them off the path. And after that, of course, وَخَتْمَ عَلَىٰ سَمْعِهِ وَقَلْبِهِ I closed their hearing and I closed their hearts. The first thing was, he closed, it there, he closed their sama'a, their hearing. Of course, that itself has its own philosophy. I'll dissect this verse for you, if you don't mind, in the first opening lecture of our five lecture series, to really get to what I'm trying to get to. We live in very, very dangerous times, scary times. You're afraid as parents and grandparents and youth, I'm afraid as a parent and as a husband and as a father and as a sibling. And we have to rethink the approach that we have to have by living in this part of the world. Because we don't have a plan B. There is no plan B to hop on a plane and go somewhere and find a corner where it might be a little bit quiet. Maybe you might have some plan to go somewhere else, but most of you are here. You might travel within the U.S. or maybe within North America, but this is plan A, plan B, and plan C. Now how do I raise my kids here? How do I protect my own deen here? How do I, as husbands and fathers, elevate my family Towards Jannah. These are all discussions that happen within this Deen Asir conversation. Because this Deen Asir is not just for those people who are Ashar back then. The Sharadat and the Shar inside of us as well. But let's finish the verse, inshallah, and we'll go from there. So Allah says, We have what? We have covered. We have sealed their hearing. And because their hearing is sealed, nothing going in, their hearts are sealed. And over their eyes, Allah says, I have placed a ghishawa, a covering. And then he asks a profound question that all of you have to ask yourself. God knows I'm asking myself then all the time. Once all this happens, once all this happens, who will guide you after Allah? Where are you going to go? Who do you have left? This person, that person, this government, that government, right, left, blue? Okay. Which means that ilm, I'm sorry, it might sound odd, isn't enough. Imam Khomeini rahmatullah in his masterpiece of Adab al-Salat talks about the fact there are those that are just stuck on debate and debate and debate. They can debate the best of the best. But that, that ilm that they have, which is profound, mind you, they're very well-educated, well-read in all topics, it becomes a hijab al-akbar. It becomes a, a grand veil in front of them. When Imam Ali now was about to go to war with the Khawarij, he sent Ibn Abbas. Ibn Abbas is a heavyweight companion. He says, go talk to him about what their intentions are. Tell him, I don't want to go to war. Let's try to find some peace. When you go there, Ibn Abbas, don't debate with these people. Don't. Don't get in some ilmi bahas with them or some philosophical discussion. 
I'm paraphrasing, they'll make circles around you. Just deliver my message, get their message and come back. Now when he comes back, Ibn Abbas, Allah. And the Ashab ask Ibn Abbas, can you describe these Khawarij for us? To his description, you would think, oh my God, this guy is describing a, a, a perfect servant of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their lips are dry, cracking from the dhikr of Allah. Their foreheads are scarred from the sujood of Allah. There's always groups around them reciting the Quran over and over and over again. They were busy, they were mashghul and dhikr and ibadah when I got there. Who are these people about to go to war with Amir al Mu'mineen? Knowledge upon knowledge, no doubt about it. Sometimes that knowledge becomes a hijab if it's not accompanied with the humbling act of ibadah. You can have all the knowledge you want. I can spend decades in the hawza, but until I rub my nose in dirt and claim subhanahu rabbi ala wa bihamdi, that knowledge could what? Could lead me away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we've seen individuals, I know all of you have, they find Allah on operating tables as doctors, they lose Allah in the hawza. Very possible. That's why the discussion on knowledge in Islam is not my topic. Ilm in Islam is not a subject-based reality. It's a niyat-based reality. <laughs> that there are people who can find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and dissecting a frog in their bio class. And like I said, there are those who can lose Allah by dissecting the Quran in front of them if they don't have the right source. Allah says that very ilm, ala ilmin. With that knowledge of Allah, of Allah, Allah, Allah will now make them zaleel off the path. And then of course, he says, as I, as I mentioned before, that I will what? I will, first of all, I will block your hearing, your listening. That's the avenue of knowledge. The Holy Prophet, Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Before I present the hadith, can I ask you all to please move a little bit forward? If there are people who are standing by the door. Just come a little bit closer, please. I know you don't know me, but a little bit closer is okay. You'll get to know me. Ajo. Ajo, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come, come, come. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. You guys look hot. Are you guys hot? No? Okay. All right. Wake up sweating in the city. Sallu ala Muhammad. Muhammad. <laughs> a man comes to the Holy Prophet, he says, Ya Rasulullah ma'ala ilma. Very carefully. I'm trying to establish these two sources today. The letter of Imam Ali and this verse of the Quran. He says, what is knowledge? He says, the first thing he says, al-insat. Knowledge is silence. Fumma what else is knowledge, he says. Five different questions he asks. As a spoiler alert, there's five questions. What else he says? He says, al-istama'a. Istama'a is different from sama'a. Alim is mawjood, you can ask him. There's one thing where you listen to something. It's one thing where you hear something. Okay? It's one thing where all of you ask us, you know, in the mall now I'm going, I'm taking my wife shopping because I messed up or I argued and I did something wrong. So I took her shopping for three hours. Yeah, but in Masoom, but yeah, yeah, I know. And there's music going on in the mall. What do I do about that, Milan? Do I go and ask the mall manager to shut it off while I, while I shop? No. Restaurants, elevators, those are all, that's all music. As long as you're not listening to it and hearing it, the fiqh has made a difference between those two. One is listening attentively, when now you, know, you word the lyrics and you, you, know, and, and, and you walk differently and you, and, and you spend more time in the store because your, your song is on. That's listening very carefully. One of course is hearing. The Prophet says it's not about the idea that you are hearing the knowledge. It's tama, you know, you're listening very carefully. Thumma what else is knowledge? He says, al hivz to retain what you've heard. Thumma the fourth level of knowledge. He's after that, amalun bih, act on what you've retained. 
And the last one he says is al-nashr. Now spread what you have acted upon. Look at the levels of knowledge and think about what people like me, or maybe all of you, how we treat knowledge. The moment we hear something, he says, silence, listen very carefully, retain it, act on it, and then spread it. We might have it the opposite. We'll spread it, maybe act on it, and then afterwards, after this WhatsApp forwards that's forwarded many times, then all of a sudden we're quiet. It wasn't me, I'm sorry, somebody else. <laughs> Let's have it a little bit. Allah knows that your avenue of knowledge are your ears. The first thing that an unborn baby can, can do is hear in the womb of the mother. Right? That's the first faculty of knowledge for any. Allah says, I've, sh I've shut that off. Naturally, when that's off, your heart is off, your eyes are off. After that, he challenges a very, very important, important issue. Who is going to guide you after this? What do you have left? Invites you and I to be the Ahl al-Dhikr, to stop and think about these things. Now, that's the verse, that's our base verse for the five nights. Come to his line in the letter, letter of, of, of Malik Ashtar. Let's understand a couple of things here. Number one, he says, in the deen, this deen, we know by now, because he's written the letter, the Ummah now has come to him, Amir al-Mu'manin, and begged him to become their Khalifa. And he accepted. He hesitated, but he accepted. And the first thing he said was that, I am a rajalun fa'al in Najibul I'm a man of action. Meaning what? I'm going to revive the teachings of Rasulullah. His words, his sunnah, to the point where the first salat led by Imam Ali after they begged him to become Khalifa, many people are quoted by saying that today it felt like we were praying behind Rasulullah after 20 plus years. So there's no doubt that his government, his amal, his sunnah, meaning Imam Ali's, was that of the Holy Prophet. Why did he feel the need to say, have a deen? This deen, it's such a beautiful ishara for you and I. That the very teachings of the Holy Prophet has become captive and imprisoned. These are people now, some people now who have done who have performed bid'ah against a religion, innovation against a religion in the 20, 20 plus years. And reviving that is important. And again, I'll, I'll make that link between that line in the letter of Nahj al and all of us today. Because right away, you and I are thinking historically, these are people that existed in Imam Ali's time that were sharir, that were evil. And he's talking about that. It's a historical sentence. It's not a historical sentence only. Please. We have, to, we have to recapture the need to look at our deen inward. That's been my entire focus this Muharram. And all of you know that you've heard me, I talk to myself up here. I don't have the gall or the audacity to sit there and tell you, you do this and you do that and you do that. Baba, I need the most help up here. But we have to sometimes change the narrative about historically they did this wrong, historically they did that wrong. What about those people? What about those people? All of those elements exist inside you and I. You and I. Aidil Ishraq at the hands of those who are evil, that evil exists inside of us. If your mind went to Ma'avia and his likes and blah, 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 there's a many Ma'avia inside of you and me. We talk about those who do dhulm against Imam Hussein's message, we think about Shimr, we think about Hormala, all those, I'm sorry, it's a, a tough statement, all those mini shimmers, mini Hormalas exist inside of us. We can talk about it being a historical conversation and leave it in history. Or we can make his words alive today, which is exactly why he uttered them to begin with. Yes, he's talking to Malik. But through Malik now, he's guiding you and I. If that deen was captive at the hands of the evilness that existed back then, who is imprisoning our deen today inside of us? What evil is inside of us that's taken our deen and placed it inside captivity? And the reason why I chose religion in my title, not Islam, because this is a unfortunate phenomenon that's affecting the churches and the synagogues and the masajid. I talk to all of these faith leaders in Toronto, wherever I go, whenever I can, 
the exact same story. Our buildings are empty, Sayyid. We can't attract our youth. They have a disdain for religion. There's a blatant attack on religion right now in the media, in entertainment, in the words of our politicians, et cetera, et cetera. From the member, from off the member, inside of our hearts. And this captivity that the religion is not right now going through is a dire state for us to stop and understand. That's why the Quran now is invited. Stop and think about this for a second. Are you that person? Am I that person? Where I've removed Allah, or I've placed Allah in a corner that when I need you, God, I'll call upon you. Otherwise, I will what? I will just go based on what I feel. That's why Allah posed that question very, very beautifully. After you've left Allah, or Allah now has sealed all from your eyes to your heart to your eyes, to your ears, then where, where are you going to go? Then what do you do? Then you resort inwards. And now these statements like, well, I think this is what the deen should look like. If you ask me, who's asking you? In my opinion, Baba, I didn't ask for your opinion. This is not, the, the deen is not naqis or, or, or not kamil. Al-yawma akmalta lakum deenakum. It's been perfected already. No one's asking you or me to fill in the holes. The Prophet left this portion. No, he didn't. And if there are new issues, there's a whole maraja system there to fill those holes. You and I, Masha, don't need to think about the idea, well, let's fill this hole. No. Think about how can I apply the deen into my life. Not how can I make sure that the deen now applies to me, meaning my own life. Right? It goes from me to the deen or the deen to me. It's up to me. But I will say, you don't have many choices after me. I'm sorry. The society, yourself, surroundings now have proven to us that they're okay. We're spending billions of dollars in destroying what? The morality of us and our children. And that's why these majalis and these gatherings and this nashis is so important. It's not just coming as an annual historic commemoration. It's the idea of what? Of us coming and reviving the hearts. That harara the Prophet talks about. That fire talks about. You know, Imam Radha alayhi salatu wa salam, Allahumma salam. He says, Man jalasa majlisan yuhya fihi amruna lam yamut qalbuhu. The one who sits in a majlis, in a gathering where our affairs, yuhya, are revived, are given hayat, are given life, lam yamut qalbuhu. That person's heart will never die. Will never die. And right now, this society, I don't mean this society, I mean globally, they're preying on dead hearts. They're preying on the numbness of our youth. They're waiting for them to fall asleep and then they're preying on them. And they love this idea of us, of, of us what? Of just numbing our youth, strolling yourself to sleep. Reel after reel after reel. Right? We used to count sheep when we couldn't sleep. We used to sing lullabies. Now we just check our reels until we fall asleep watching our reels with our phone like this as we snore. That's our reality. And we make it sound like, I make it sound like, well, what do I do? Where do I go? What happened to the deen? Why is the deen all of a sudden a lost cause to us? Why do we think that for something, the, the deen is something that happened 1,400 years ago? The fact that, the, that, that Imam had to point out that you need to what? Free Malik. Uh, what he's saying ultimately is, you need to free the deen of Muhammad or deen in Nab from the prison so the people have a fighting chance against everything else. That's essentially what the mafum is of the jumla, right? For in the deen qad kana asidan. This is a deen that was captive and might still be at the hands of those that are evil. We have to ask ourselves, do I hand, do I have hands of evil inside of me today? That's blocking or imprisoning my religion. There are some that are just not sold on religion, not sold on, 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 on the deen. There has to be another way. I don't pray salat, Malana, but I do yoga. Good for you. I don't pray Salat, but I am very mindful. I meditate. You should try meditation. Then they sent me articles on the benefits of meditation. They actually sent me articles on people, mashallah, who do a what? Do a pros and cons comparison between five minutes of Salat and five minutes of meditation to prove to me that five minutes of meditating, you actually get closer to yourself and God as opposed to a four rakat zuhur. That's dangerous. They tell me that intermittent fasting is more beneficial to me 
than the month of Ramadan is. Donating towards IEC with a blank check, or not a blank check, but a check, is better to me than giving khums to our marajah. Is that not a deen asid moment? Absolutely it is. Is that not telling the deen, thank you very much, you were good for Mecca and Medina, maybe Kufa and Karbala, but not Houston 2023. Not Toronto 2023. I'm good, I'll handle it, I know how to get to God. Thank you very much. And then we've taken a deen of submission and made it into a deen of individualism. And those are idols. Those are today's idols. And I'm sorry, they're more dangerous than the idols of the Meccans. At least those you can break. You can smash them. You can consume them. They used to consume them. Right? You can set them on fire. You can take one idol like Amir Ibrahim and, and break the other ones. But what about the idol within? You know how hard that is to first find it, then break it, and live life without it after you've lived so, for so many years with it? That's why Allah says, be careful of those kind of people. These are people that don't have anywhere else to go. Who are taking their ilah as their hawa. It can't be that you wake up one morning, I'm sorry, and you're bored of your wife, so I want to divorce after 20 years and four kids. Why? I just feel like Imran. I got bored of her. True stories. I got bored of my wife after two decades. So I just said, you know what? I'll just leave. What's the point of me sticking around? I have a thousand more examples. It's vital that we understand these are not just historical statements or a wahi that came down to the Prophet 1400 years ago. The beauty and miracle nature of the Quran is one that some verses, if not all of them, are very much active today. There are some verses that when you read them, you feel like the wahi just came down five minutes ago. It describes my halat and the state of the ummah right now to perfection. And that shows me that the Qur'an is alive today, number one, and also it shows me that as much as we think we have succeeded or we have elevated or we have progressed, sometimes we haven't, I'm sorry. Because progression is not measured by those elements outside of you and I. Progression is measured by elements inside of you and I. Our phones are smarter. Our cars run on electric power. I can turn on my washing machine from the member if I wanted to. I can turn down my AC right now from my home right now, from my, where I am right now. Everything around me, mashallah, but am I mashallah or not? Are the elements inside of me that have progressed? And dare I say, and I say it to myself, there's regression possibly. There's signs of that jahiliyyah era. And the Qur'an attached by the Ahl and this is why it's so important that we understand what Thaqalain means. Two weighty things the Prophet says. Kitab Allah wa itrati Ahl bayti The Book of Allah and my family, I've left both behind. Because both of them complement each other so, so well. This first from Surah Jasiyah, this line from Amir al-Mu'mani. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So we want to explore this a little bit more across these five nights. Why is it that some of us now have subconsciously, I'm not saying everyone, no one here wakes up tomorrow morning and says, I'm going to put Islam in, the, in, in jail and live my life the way it is. No. But sometimes the way we decide certain affairs and make concrete and crucial decisions, there isn't a remnant of the deen in there. There's a remnant of my khaishat. I feel like this is my time, right? My time not to look after myself. Now, let's come to one more hadith by Amir al I want to tackle this issue a little bit today as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a primary discussion and then towards Masai. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, please. In two different places, Imam Ali talks about the idea of desires and hope. Because in the verse of the Qur'an, in the statement in Malik Esther's letter, in a hadith that Imam Khayyim has done shara on in his channel hadith, all of these three have two or three things in common. Is that sometimes the human being has this inordinate amount of desire, this delusion almost. And you, all of you know to the point, whoever heard, you've heard me, I'm not somebody who, who comes up here and gives you bad news and tells you, you know what, 
Well, I'd like to thank the speaker. Right? Is my time up already? Or? Salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, sorry. He says in his very famous statement, Innama akhafu alayhim uthnatayn. There are two things that I am very scared of you when it comes, scared about you when it comes to you. There are two things I'm fearful for you about. Two things. Ittaba'u al-hawa wa tul al-amal. Very, very famous hadith. The first one is that we do ittaba' of our desires. Now look, I'm not talking about desires like sin and you know, money and the opposite gender and this and that and music. and Those are all things that you've heard about. and right? You're working on them, inshallah. It's a little bit of a deeper conversation. This desire for me to be in control, this desire for me to be the master of myself, my own echo chamber, my own filter bubble. I want to be my own algorithm. All I do is I feed myself what I want, what I want to see in here. Right? This technology that we have right now on social media is not just, oh, that's cool technology. It's a, it's, it's a reflection of really what they're trying to do in this day and age. I'm not against social media, but I'm, you have to understand a little bit what's happening. He says, for those, وَإِنَّمَا إِتَّبَاعُ الْحَوَىٰ يَسُدُّ عَنِ الْحَقِّ He says that it actually prevents you, you and I from understanding what the truth is. Follow me very carefully, please. This continuous ittiba of desires, the continuous of giving into what we want. And I'm not telling, asking any of you that, you know, do you want us to be robots? Why not? Are we not? You absolutely are human beings. You're human. I'm a human. We have desires. You have desires. Absolutely. Right? We have inclinations towards haram. But to give into those, to say, look, because they're inside of me, I have to act upon them. The biggest, one of the biggest issues we have today is the idea that because I can feel it and because it's inside of me, I have to act upon it. This equation is wrong, I'm sorry. We believe in inclinations. We believe in the idea that maybe you are simply an object or a result of your surroundings. No doubt about that. When you're surrounded by kufr, you're surrounded by shak, you're surrounded by the munafiqeen, it's going to have an impact on you. That's why I always say in my workshops and in my, in, in my conferences to my young guys, and a lot of you are here, mashallah, please choose your circle of friends wisely. Please. It's a humongous topic in Islam. Show me your friends, I'll show you your future in 10 years. That's why as parents, you, all of you are obsessed about who the friends are of your child, and you should be. It annoys your kid, but you should ask. Who are they? Let me meet them, interview them. You become a, an effect of, of the cause around you. It doesn't mean that you act upon it. Sometimes that's your jihad, that's my jihad, that's my struggle internally, is to know that I'm inclined towards this sin. I'm inclined towards one gender. I'm inclined towards one reality. This doesn't make sense. That doesn't make, make sense. Atheism seems to be more of an inclination for me than anything else is. At that moment, to give in, say, well, it's a side of me, I have to act upon it, is absurd. It's illogical. That's the, the, that's the hope that Imam Ali talks about. That's the ittaba al hawai talks about. That everything inside that we want, to act upon that. He says, if you do that enough, then haq and truth becomes a veil for you. It's actually prevented from you, he says. It's in front of you. We can't see it. Every single night now, for the first 10 days, you sat there listening to Qasim Khuzah tell you this and this. And that is the deal. Salla Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Muhammad Ali Muhammad Salawat. You sat here, you heard this amazing alim tell, uh, tell you what, for 10 nights, 12, 12 nights, there are some people who came and they left the exact same way that they came. 
in front of them, 10 hours, 11 hours, 12 hours, huck in front of them. But naturally, when you, when you become, I become somebody who I enslave myself to, where is the deen going to go? The deen will be pushed aside. The deen will be in prison. The deen will be, look, you are in prison where you are the least effective. I need you there. You can't be running the show. You can't be making decisions for me. You can't be running my life. That's not what I want. So I want to put you there. I haven't converted. I'm still a Muslim, but I prefer to have my deen, again, subconsciously, over in prison where I can control the deen. Let him out once in a while, smell of fresh air, Shabi Qadr, Shabi Ashur, put him back in. We have the keys, right? We're the jail, jail keeper, he's a prisoner. Tell me, tell me I'm off here. Tell me that's not what's happening right now in a lot of us. A lot of us. And so we have to understand that these are words that we've heard several times, but they hit differently, especially in Muharram, when the hearts are soft. So when you look at these ideas that, are, that, that he says, look, th th this hope that you have is delusion. Let's be careful. We, we know that hopelessness is a major sin in Islam, no doubt about it. I the Desqayyid so talks about the second major sin after shirk is hopelessness, is my use in na'umidi inside of Allah, no doubt about that. Of course, we can't be hopeless when we have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but even hope has its limits. Right? You skip every second class, you don't handle one assignment, you bomb the midterm, you scrap by the final, Ya Allah, give me an A, please, in my course. Come on, A. Come on, A. You get a D. You're like, what? The hope is great, but it was a little bit delusional. That's why the same Imam Ali says, don't be like those. Yarjoon on akhira bi ghayri amal. You have a hope for the akhira, but without amal. Do something where Allah says, okay, you can be hopeful based on this. Bring something to the table. Say, look, Prof. I, I, I handed in the assignments. I worked hard in the midterm. I struggled with stats, but this is what I did. At least bump it up. But what are you going to come to the prof with? You skip class. You miss the assignments. You went there for the, for the midterm. You barely scrapped by the finals. The fact that I passed you, you should be such that shukr right now. You're asking me to give you a B or A. On what, on what cause? What, what proof do you possibly have? So the captivity of our religion, of our religion, and I'm asking you to turn inwards in these next five nights. We have solutions for everybody, mashallah. Right? We have nuskhahs and prescriptions for you, for him, for her. They should do that. He or she should definitely do this. Th these two, they need this, they need that. Oh, nuskhah upon nuskhah. Stamp, yeliji up, yeliji up, yeliji. Handing them like we're Oprah. You get one, you get one, you get one. Right? Meanwhile, if I ask yourself to self-diagnose yourself, I don't know where to start, Mana. What do I do? This and that. It's not that we don't know what, we do, what to do. We're worried about what might come out of us. That's why one of the things that Marhum Atul Misbayyazi talks about when it comes to death, he says the, the khawf of mawt, the fear of death, is not so much our a'mal or not so much the grave. It's about the idea that death is a mulaqat with our self. فَإِنَّهُ مُلَاقِيكُمْ at that moment, I can't blame the alim and the community and the husband and the wife and the in-laws and you know, the fact that I was raised in, I don't know, some small town USA, there was no center there. We were, we, you know, we were raised on YouTube and live feeds and blah, blah, blah. At that moment now, it's you and your amal. It's me and my amal. I can't take that. I can't, I can't blame anybody. That scares us. Because now our actual, our actual essence now is shown. So I want these five nights, for me especially, to be an inward conversation. Where has my deen gone? If my deen is leading the way, alhamdulillah. Fantastic. Strengthen it so I can ride through this wave right now. We're in a very tough wave right now, guys. In a very tough wave right now. It can't be that we're just doing things as we did before. The Prophet, the, 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 Allah says, if you choose, if I choose to make that desire of mine, number one, that it, the moment I wake up and I want something, I don't even think about consequences or who it might affect. No, I just simply, as my Lord does serve me, I serve my desires. 
the, the domino effect after that is very dangerous. Couple that with the fact that he says, when shar, when evil entities lead and govern, the deen becomes asir khutbah khutbah by itself. Do we have evil elements governing us today? Look, we want to understand one point, if I have time, philosophically, then we'll move, move forward. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Again, Imam Khomeini in his chair hadith talks about, in his very first hadith on the struggle against the self, he talks about these two elements. Anger and desire, shahwa and ghadab. Very, very quickly, a, there's you know, paragraphs that he writes, but very quickly, I don't have time left. He says, these two have been with you, all of us, since day number one, number one. The moment the baby is born, it knows what it wants, it knows what it doesn't want. It won't be able to speak a word. It'll tell you, if you're trying to feed it, and it's uh, sleepy, it won't, it won't feed. If you're trying to put it to sleep and its diaper is full, it won't sleep. It knows what it wants, it knows what it doesn't want. Sometimes if you're trying to, trying to stuff a ball down, down, down and say, like, eat, 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 and, and the baby's full, but it wants to sleep, it will take the bottle and throw it right back at you. And say, I don't want this. So anger and desire, from day number one now, are there. All the way through, right? Terrible twos, right? Three nagers, <laughs> all of them bit by bit. Taking the Toys R Us or a toy store, you can't have a toy, right? They throw a tantrum on the floor, kicking and screaming. And they get through that first stage, first eight, nine, ten years of life now, anger, desire, anger, desire. I know what I want, I know what I don't want. And as it gets older, it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Along comes what? Balugh. And Balugh is not just jismi. It's Balugh jismi, Balugh akli, Balugh dini. There are some people, mashallah, who have the body, sorry, the beard, the voice, their balik, but they haven't quite crossed that balughe dini yet. They're, they're what? They're immature when it comes to religion. They're immature when it comes to their intellect. But they're a 40 year old man, 65 year old woman. They haven't gone through the other categories of balugh. And the primary reason why there is a celebration inside. The deen. And there is ulama in, in, in Iran. We, we used to attend you know, these jashans of celebrating Balugh. The reason for that is not because they reached a certain age, but now you have the faculties inside of you to govern these two inside of you. Now Allah has what? Has injected, has invited what? The akl to the party. He said, look, akl, your job is to look after those two over there. Anger and ghadab. They're out of control. Get them right. Meanwhile, anger and, anger and shahwa and desire has been around since what? 10, 11 years, 9 years, 14 years. They've ran the show for a decade now, for 10 years now. And unless that intellect is strong enough to control those two, that akal will be devoured by those two. And we've seen that. The removal of the akal, the weakening of the intellect, Give strength to shahwa and ghadab, desire and anger. If, if not controlled, of course they're going to run wild. And right now, up until Balik, up until those days of Balug for, for, for a girl or a boy, right now they've been number one. Yeah, there's been some tarbit by the parents. Watch your voice. You know, let's control, control your desires. It's okay if you don't get everything. That's okay, but ultimately they don't understand why until they become Balik. Then Allah says, now... You are able to do what? You're able now to make that turn where you are controlling these two. The problem is, they're strong. And your, your whole life, my whole life, if I can summarize it internally, is a battle between that quwwat aqaliyah to govern shahwa and ghadab. Yeah, waham is there, but really it's shahwa and ghadab. My desires and my anger. How many people in our community have anger issues? Have desire issues? How many divorces have happened from these two issues? How many families are broken? How many communities have been split in half and then in half and then in half based on these two faculties? 
And the deen has come to inject us with the intellect. And that aql is both to know what God is in terms of books and who God is in terms of sujood. When you have this level of the, of the intellect, it comes in, it overpowers, it governs. Then, what used to be an enemy of, of, of the internal kingdom, ghadab for example, anger, now becomes what? An ally. Now, from that anger, shuja'at is born, is, is born. From that desire, modesty is born. All because it's been governed by the aql properly. That doesn't happen without the deen. Where will you go, he says. After Allah, where will you go? Who will you turn to? Allah brings forth this entire picture. I've given you all of these faculties, but I gave you a governing force. Your job is to what? Empower that force inside of you. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad, please. So we are establishing tonight through Surah Jasiya, through the letter of Amir al-Mu'mineen, through various ahadith of Amir al-Mu'mineen, that this deen is asir and in prison, when we begin to what? We begin to follow our desires. When our decisions are made with only me in mind. I feel like this today, so I become this tomorrow. I feel like I want this, so I become this. I don't want this anymore, so I'm going to walk away from it. No fear of God, no sense of responsibility, nothing. Those are individuals now, of course, who have taken deen. Thank you very much, you're in the prison. You say, yeah, I still believe in God, of course. I'm not, a, I'm not a horrible person. I'm just looking after myself now. And that's what happens. When the deen doesn't lead, we end up leading ourselves. As the Prophet says, Ya ilahi la takilni illa nafsi tarfata'ainin abada. Oh Allah, don't leave me at the disposal of myself. Don't leave me alone with myself for a blink of an eye, he says. Meaning what? I constantly need you and you alone. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The days after Ashura now, we can see this. We can see how low individuals can go when their khaishat are their, are their ilah, are their desires, are their Lord. That's why Karbala to us is a university. Is a university. It's a complete package. It brings the softness of the heart to us. It brings the philosophy of the deen to us as well. It shows us to human capacity. And for those individuals who believe that after Imam Hussein gave his life on the day of Ashura, that Muharram is done, ask the heart of Zainab tonight. Now Zainab bi Kubra's Ashura has begun. Now Imam Sajjad's mission has begun. On the day of Ashura, you heard the maqtal on the day of Ashura when Imam Hussein went to go give the Uhud of Imamat to Imam Sajjad after burying Ali Yasgar. And Imam Sajjad looks up at Baba, says, Baba, you're in this state, zakham upon zakham, your back is bent, your eyes are, 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 are glossy, you're barely standing up, you're exhausted, you're tired, you're sweating, you look like you've been through a war. And then he sits here, looks at Baba, said, Baba, Aina, Aina, Abu Fazl Abbas, Baba. Where is Abu Fazl Abbas? If you're in this state, where is Abbas? At that moment, when he realizes that only he and his father are the last men left, then he says to Bibi Zainab, Pupiyama, give me my sword and give me my stick. I need my stick to help myself up. I need my sword to defend my father. And that's why he says, Ya Bunaya, this is not your battle today. Your battle is when? when you take these women from Karbala to Kufa, Kufa to Sham. When this Qafila reached the outskirts of Kufa, Ibn Ziyad was busy, what? Decorating Kufa. He declared Eid. He declared a celebration. A holiday for the day of Kufa, for the city of Kufa. And people are wondering what's happening. All the streets of Kufa are decorated. He spent so much time making sure that people realize this is our celebration. Why? Because this qafila from Karbala is coming. <laughs> Meanwhile, Umar bin Saad now is in a hurry to get to Kufa. Why? Yazid says, 
The one now who brings this oppressed qafila to Kufa, there is a large reward waiting for you. Umar ibn Sa'ad is in a hurry to get to Kufa. Ibn Ziyad says, wait, I'm not done decorating Kufa yet. Sends out invitations, dignitaries, respectful men, all lined up to see what? To see this qafila of Zainab al Kubra enter Kufa. Very difficult. Very, very difficult. And so finally, Umar ibn Sa'd does what? Umar ibn Sa'd now waits outside the outskirts of Kufa, parks this qafla on the outskirts of Kufa, in that beaming hot desert sun. And as people now are coming to see what's happening in the outskirts of Kufa, all they see are these women and these children of the Holy Prophet now. After a while now a crowd forms, people are coming bit by bit, all laying their hand, their eyes on Zainab al all looking at Bibi Zainab, all looking at Bibi Sakina, Umbi Kuthum, all these women who, 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 the Ahlul Bayt now, will do what? Will do everything in their power to protect them from the men. It's at that moment that from the Nolkineza, from the spear, Imam Hussein's lips began to move and Surah Kaf could be heard. Why did he do that? Two minutes into Masadullah. The ulama said the only reason why Hussein did that was to divert the attention of the men from looking at his sister and his wife to looking at the Nahukaneza up there. When somebody asked Imam Sajjad that we heard at that moment outside Kufa that all the heads were on spears and all of them were moved up so they could see the heads before they could see the women. There was one head that wouldn't stay on the spear. That every time they put it on the head, it would fall. On the head, it would fall. On the head, it would fall. Is this true? He says, yes, it's true. Whose head was that? That was the head of Abu Fazl Abbas, whose head would not stay on the spear. Why? He says his entire life, he did not say Bibi Zainab without a veil. This is one time where he was high up there and he said, I don't want to see Zainab al without a veil. So he falls off the Nebuchadnezzar. Umar ibn Sa'd now does a heinous crime, takes the head of a boss and what ties it around the neck of his horse. He enters the Kufa with Abbas's head now bouncing off of the plains of Kufa. سَيَعْلَمُ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا أَيَّمُ الْقَلِبِينَ الْقَلِبُونَ إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ مَاتِمِ حُسَيْن يَا حُسَيْن يَا حُسَيْن